hello. I'm uh, not sure if anybody is uh, out there with me anymore, uh, whether you took a bathroom break or whether you entirely disappeared. But quite frankly, I don't know what happened. Uh, my computer just crashed. And, uh, and then it was a little bit of a challenge to get going again. But nonetheless, here I am. And uh, I am going to continue with my presentation. And I'm not sure if anybody will be out there, but uh, this will be really a part two to what uh, I've already shared. And actually, I think I've arrived at a pretty good moment to dispense with the PowerPoint and to go to really what is the key um, item for today, the focus on uh, the geocosmic reality and the very, very special day that, uh, that this is, June, December 20, December 21st, uh, a very, very special solstice moment, but especially special because of the uh, conjunction of the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, which, if our skies weren't so gray, we ought to have been able to see this evening. And maybe we will over the next few days. But a very, very special moment in the uh, cosmic uh, uh, world because this hasn't occurred in 800 years, this, uh, this moment of time. And basically what I'm wanting to talk about uh, now really is about the geocosmic knowledge of the people of the um, Americas, the indigenous peoples of North America. And I think I started off by wanting to, to share this with you about Grandpa Alonzo, uh, William Commander's uh, father. And um, yeah, so this is an article written by John Durant. Uh, uh, it was uh, in the Saturday Evening Post in December, December 23rd, 1943. And um, he, he writes about uh, his uh, journeys into the northern Quebec uh, bush with this most special guide, uh, Grandpa Alonzo Commander. Evelyn, a little while ago, in, in the first, uh, the, in the earlier video for today, talked about the star knowledge uh, of her grandfather, Alonzo, his knowledge of the stars and fire. And uh, I want to read you a little excerpt from our thesis. And I say, it was also mathematical and numerical uh, this knowledge of the ancestors, and this is revealed in the knowledge of the laws of nature of William Commander's father, Alonzo Commander, described with good reason as the best guide in the world by writer John Durand in the December 23, 1944, the Saturday Evening Post article. Respect for his knowledge deepened one January when, in the middle of the cold winter, his father told William Commander that if he had any cut wood in the bush, he should move it out because the area would be flooded on February 24th. That would have constituted a very early spring thaw. To the day his father was right, William advised me. The 19th the 20, 2017 flooding throughout the Ottawa River watershed immediately brought Grandpa Alonzo Commander's prediction 
about the 1974 floods to the minds of William Commander's son-in-law, Tommy Dewashi, and his daughter, Evelyn Commander Dewashi, and Grandpa Alonzo's late granddaughter, Daisy Mary Commander Jaco, separately. Uh, and, and each of them uh, revealed this or shared this with me in personal conversations in the spring of 2017. In the fall uh, before 1974 floods, the fall of 1973, Alonzo Commander had said next June the lake will be flooded and you will be going around in canoe. He died in March and in June the historic 1974 flood came. William Commander's own log cabin meeting house was swept away and William Commander did in fact canoe where his home now stands and where people, you know, uh, camped out during the, the 15 years of gatherings on the land. It is interesting that the dams upstream had contributed to the flooding. What are the implications of paying attention to this indigenous way of understanding the laws of nature? Grandfather Alonzo had anticipated that this flooding would happen. Um, the Government of Canada's website on Environment and Climate Change Canada notes the following. The Gatineau River, a major tributary of the Ottawa, drains approximately 26,000 square kilometers of the Gatineau Hills lying north of Ottawa Hull. It rises to an elevation of 490 meters above sea level and flows into the Ottawa River at Point Gatineau. The river has been extensively developed for hydroelectric power and is also used in log driving operations. Between May 14th and July 2nd, 1974, the Gatineau River underwent its most serious flooding since the turn of the century. Of course, in 2017, uh, uh, we had the unprecedented flooding of the Ottawa River, and uh, people talked about eight rivers returning to their beds, beds that had been dried out by the hydro uh, manipulation of water uh, for, for so many years, came back to life. And of course, it uh, uh, flooded and caused quite a bit of damage, but it also stopped traffic on the uh, Shaudia Bridge, the Shaudia Falls, for the entire summer. In 2019, we had uh, flooding that also impacted the area. And uh, I, I mentioned this before. I had uh, gone to Baskatang, an ancient sacred site of the indigenous peoples in 2014 with uh, Daisy uh, Jaco, commander. And at that point, we noted uh, the, the tree cutting. I went back there in 2017 with William Commander's niece Lillian and with her husband Ray. And at this point, there was tree cutting and there was also a moose hanging on the tree. At the moment that the uh, Algonquin people were protesting moose hunting uh, at La Varandri Park. Later, uh, my friend uh, Carolyn and I visited uh, Oka and we met with our friends Jamie, St. Maurice Nichols, and Amanda McDonald um, in uh, Hudson. And uh, Jamie, the mayor of Hudson, uh, shared with us some of the reports of the uh, MCR, the, the municipality, which was noting that the flooding at Hudson, which you know is sort of like on the boundary of Oka, the ancient uh, um, site of the Algonquins, that area had been flooded, but as it is, uh, and, but the floods had been caused by the tree cutting in the Baskatong area in 2014. 
in that process, I began to understand how the land itself can speak to one if one pays sufficient attention. And in my photographs, I realized that the land had spoken to me in 2014, in 2017, and then I began to understand it in 2019. I think it's that kind of wake up that William Commander was hoping um, he could uh, stimulate in all of us because, of course, it's of critical importance that we all wake up to the environmental crises and challenges of our day. Okay, so now then, I want to also move to another part of my, uh, my work. And here we're talking about the voyages of uh, people uh, to North America from the uh, from 1080s. These were the Vikings, the 1300s, the 1400s, and the 1500s, and subsequently the 1500s cosmogeographic knowledge shift in thinking taking place in Europe, initiated by Copernicus and Galileo, and strongly condemned by the Vatican. And in this, I want to read to you an excerpt from my thesis. And I'll have to go back and find all these things that um, I had laid out so nicely before, but that had disappeared. But here it is. It's showing up pretty fast. Uh, so this is an excerpt from my thesis and I wanted to read you something that I had highlighted but unfortunately the bolded section is gone. Mm -hmm. Okay and following through on that thread <clears throat> where in Europe you know we're coming from a history of the dark ages Christianity, Crusades, Inquisition, which hunts also environmental challenges of unclean waters, disease, black plague of the mid 1300s, and the incumbent grapplings with the darker expressions of humanity and environment, philosophy became preoccupied with morals. And so actually that was really the portion of my thesis when I explored philosophy. But with Copernicus, Earth emerged in Western consciousness and philosophy in the late 1400s. Copernicus was the catalyst for a new thinking grounded in the cosmogeographic preoccupations of the ancient philosophers. He returned philosophy to the investigation of natural phenomena, and the Catholic Church did not take well to his decentering of religion. However, the death of innocence sustained in Western philosophy from the time of Socrates and the moral imperative or its eradication through rational science has preoccupied the domain of philosophy since. William Commander and his ancestors asserted belonging to Turtle Island, the continent of North America, since time immemorial. And from the beginnings of the retreat of the Wisconsin Glacier, moved into the American Northeast leaving evidence of their presence here for at least 12,000 years. They were preoccupied by the same original geocosmic issues as the early people of Europe, and they registered this in language that reveals knowledge of cosmic space-time realities in the heliocentric terms that Copernicus only began to assert in 1500s and Galileo as late as 1733. Unfortunately, a huge percentage of the peoples of the Americas were decimated by European diseases by the time of Cortes, 1485 to 1547, and Charles Mann projects 80% died by 1491 in his book, uh, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus, I read books like this one and its sequel to William Commander, and our copies are annotated with his comments. So our preliminary review of early maps reports of the early voyages to North America and related observations 
suggested that indigenous knowledge of the peoples of North Amer the American Northeast influenced ge European geography and cartography. I suggest further that the new geocartographical thinking of Copernicus emerged as a result of exposure to the heliocentric cosmic knowledge of the new world reported by the voyagers to the American Northeast coast. The fact that Copernicus only began to discuss the Earth in heliocentric terms in 1500 and Galileo as late as 1633, and that both were arrested, inquisitioned, and accused of heresy for their ideas by the Catholic Church would tend to support this argument. This knowledge acquisition could have commenced with the Vikings at the turn of the 10th century, who transferred knowledge to Scotland and Europe, and with other voyagers who traveled to North America from the Western Europe in the 1300s and 1400s. Uh, <coughs> and yeah, let me leave it at that at this point. Um, and, and so what, what you see here is that I am really trying to show that the indigenous peoples of uh, North America had a very sophisticated understanding of the, uh, uh, the cosmic cycles of the stars, the planets, and uh, its implications in terms of time space. I will take a moment to acknowledge Two special people. One, Abuela Margarita from Mexico, the grandmother who was at all our gatherings and who woke up many people across Quebec and Ontario to the thinking of uh, her Mayan ancestors, her indigenous ancestors, and she always reminded us that we are all cosmic beings. And I want to also acknowledge Dr. William Sullivan, the author of the Secret of the Incas, and the arch an archaeo historian researcher into the geocosmic knowledge held in mythology, including of the ancient peoples of the Americas. And uh, he met grandfather, I think it might have been 2007 or 2009, thereafter came to many of our gatherings and, and ha helped explain to us how his research into actually global uh, mythology um, um, revealed um, indication about how um, uh, there were referential codes for animals, for stars, for planets, for topographical uh, spaces in the um, in the cosmos that enabled people to track the um, movement of time, as it were. And as we know, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, calendar knowledge of the Mayans influenced us or woke us all up in 2000 and uh, really uh, affirmed this uh, uh, very precise knowledge. Actually, there's an, an elder who is doing some uh, presentations, Zoom presentations right now on uh, the Mayan calendar. And if anybody's interested, I can link you up with her. I met her um, a few months ago, or last year actually, around about this time, in Minneapolis. A most amazing, amazing thinker, uh, thinker and uh, writer, uh, Gina Miranda. Um, then I want to move on to uh, referencing the Chaco Canyon and Dr. Brian Cox. Some of you may have watched some of his amazing, amazing uh, explorations of the, the universe, quantum physics, and uh, fascinating topics like this. And in one of them, I recall, he noted a childhood memory of the stories of the peoples of Chaco Canyon and their, their singular architecture aligned to the solar and lunar cycles, the 1066 death of a star cosmic event, which inspired him to research cosmic space and time. And uh, 
And of course, that's really, really interesting, you know, that uh, death of the star, the death of the supernova, and how it is articulated by the indigenous peoples of the area in stone, how it is um, memorialized in stone. Um, but with respect to today, I want to just show you a few minutes of another one of uh, Dr. Brian Cox's uh, video clips, the, his visits to the 13, solar, uh, 13 Towers Solar Observatory of Shankilo in Peru. The 2,500-year-old solar calendar was built up by a civilization which there's very little known. Trouble hearing? Don't skip this video. If you're suffering from premature hearing loss, the struggle could soon be over. Thanks. To Around two and a half thousand years ago, a civilization we know almost nothing about built this fortified temple in the desert. Its walls were once brilliant white and covered with painted figures. Today, all but the smallest fragments of the decorations are gone. The details of this culture and all traces of its language are lost. And yet, if you stand in the right place, you can still experience the true purpose of Chankyo in just the same way as you could the day it was built. But to do that, you have to be here before the sun rises. These towers form an ancient solar calendar. Now at different times of year, the sunrise point is at a different place on the horizon. Actually, December 21st, which here in the southern hemisphere is the summer solstice, the longest day, and the sun rises just to the right of the rightmost tower. Then, as the year passes, the sun moves through the towers until on June 21st, which is the winter solstice, the shortest day, it rises just to the left of the leftmost tower, actually just in between that mountain you can see in the distance and the leftmost tower. So at any time of year, if you watch the sun rise, you can measure its position and you can tell within an accuracy of two or three days, the date. Today's date is September the 15th. And so that means that the sun will rise between the fifth and the sixth towers. Chankyo still works as a calendar because the sun still rises in the same place today as it did when these stones were first laid down. That is a magnificent sight as the sun burns through the towers. You can almost feel the presence of the past here. I mean, imagine what it must have been like. Thousands of citizens stood here to greet the sun, which was almost certainly a deity, almost certainly their god. What a magnificent achievement. I mean, it's probably one of our earliest attempts to begin to, to measure the heavens. There's obviously more too that um, I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, something that talks about how we're all made out of stardust. And you know, uh, the indigenous peoples of Africa, the Dogan people, uh, talked about the dog star, Sirius, talked about how uh, indigenous peoples of North America have talked about how we are star people. And over the last few years, uh, there in the uh, Mall of America, in the no, in the uh, 
the mall in Washington, D.C. The Science Museum now screens uh, um, documentaries that show how we humans are part of the stardust uh, of the universe. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And in that thread, then, I wanted uh, uh, to now uh, just uh, just share a little thread of information from um, Brian Cox regarding the, the, the Shaco people. And I'm not sure whether we will later have um, Sue Lucero back on our uh, Facebook Live because she wanted to talk a little bit about it, but we may have lost her with the breakdown in our communications. Anyway, a thousand years ago, a great civilization existed in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. The Chacoans were avid stargazers and built vast 700 room mansions aligned with sun, moon, and stars. On the night of the 4th of July, 1054 AD, Chacoan Astronomers saw for themselves what happens when a star like Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse they say, finally loses its fight against gravity. A new star appeared in the clear dark skies of New Mexico, shining as brightly as the moon for several weeks before fading from view. We now know they had witnessed the supernova explosion that had happened 10,000 light years from Earth, relatively close by cosmic standards. In a single instant, the dying star emitted more energy than our sun will emit in its entire lifetime, casting shadows on the distant Earth. The Shakoans documented the explosion in a painting that still exists in an overhanging ledge in the canyon. It depicts the crescent moon, a handprint pointing to the place in the sky where the supernova happened, and a bright glowing new star beside the moon. You can see that here in this image. The hand, the moon, and the star. We know so much about this explosion. Um, because we can see its remains today. In the place in the sky where the star once shone, there is now a brightly colored cloud of interstellar gas known as the Crab Nebula. This cloud is filling with the chemical elements that the star produced in its lifetime, including carbon, oxygen, and iron, vital for life. But here's another interesting little tidbit. There's an extra and wonderful twist to the story of the origin of the building blocks of people. The assembly of the heavier metals in the cores of stars stops with ions, with the element of iron. Stars cannot, in the normal course of their lives, build anything heavier than iron because this process does not release energy and does not help the star in its fight against gravity. But if you're wearing a wedding ring or gold jewelry, look at it now. Gold is heavier than iron, so it is not made from the heart of stars. So where does it come from? The answer is that gold is made in the last seconds in the lives of the most massive stars in the universe, the supernova explosions. Gold is so rare because the conditions need to make it are rare. On average, in a galaxy of 100 million stars, there will only be one supernova explosion per century, and that explosion itself is only hot enough to make gold for a minute. That is why gold is so important. Okay, so, so much for, uh, for the knowledge from uh, Dr. Brian Cox affirming, confirming the ancient knowledge of the peoples of the Americas. Ancient sites of related spatial spiritual significance, um, and I'm talking now specifically here about the ones that are related to the story we're telling, 
um, the Great Pyramid of Giza over four and a half thousand years ago, 4.5, 4,500 years ago. The Mayan uh, Sun Temple um, built around 200 AD. Ankara Wat uh, from the 12th century. And our very special Asanabka Shaudia site, which uh, we say was visited by people over the course of the last 10,000 years at least since the retreat of the Champlain Sea. And in fact, artifacts from 2014 um, found at the confluence of the Gatineau and Ottawa River were dated back to 8,000 years uh, ago. Some of these artifacts coming as far away as Lake uh, uh, Superior indicating of, and from other parts of uh, New York State, indicating that this was a hub, this was a meeting place of ancient people, and really ancient people over a much longer duration than the um, focus uh, of uh, many cultures on these other places we've mentioned, um, Egypt and uh, etc. Uh, Stonehenge, too, I believe, was uh, um, created in um, 2000-2500 BC. So again, uh, in the range of uh, 4,000 4, years ago. But what we're saying is the Asanabka site is, a very, is, is the most ancient site that we do know about where people gather together in, in this uh, human uh, uh, um, attention to the energy of a special place. Now, this uh, information was researched for us, for Circle of All Nations, by uh, Eckhart Schmidt, uh, the author of The Great Pyramid of Giza, decoding the measure of a monument and uh, his uh, website is there uh, showing his detailed uh, uh, study of, of Giza, his detailed understanding of the, the cosmic, uh, uh, the cosmic, uh, what do you call that? Um, that's another word. Um, for the, 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 the great ball, uh, uh, which encompasses, which holds the Earth and our universe and our Milky Way and our galaxy, really. Um, and um, working on his measurements uh, with, with such great precision, he was able to also uh, identify for us uh, the locational intermesh of these sacred sites with Shaudia Victoria Island. We did share this information with Government of Canada. Uh, uh, we thought this would help uh, 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 encourage perhaps the creation of a protected site, a UNESCO site, uh, take us away from the controversial challenges between developers and community, indigenous and non-indigenous community but uh, unfortunately, uh, even that effort uh, failed to, uh, to allow for any bridging. And as you know, right now, the sacred Shaudia site, respected from time immemorial, at least 10,000 years, by the indigenous peoples of the land, uh, has been desecrated, has been uh, um, damned when in 2007, grandfather raised the cry for the protection of at least one site from uh, the invasive damming. And it's ironic, really, because right now, uh, damming is being condemned on a much larger scale uh, um, for environmental reasons. Uh, um, and yet uh, we've lost uh, the, the, the heart of uh, the sacred, uh, most unusual, waterfalls, but we'll talk more about that in another paper. But the challenges uh, continue. And um, most recently, Lindsay Lambert 
uh, who's been uh, actually interested in this area from way before anybody else because he brought Grandfather Commander the earliest photographs, the earliest stereoscope, uh, so that we could imagine what a, a falls might have really looked like in power uh, in three dimensions. Uh, years before the formal articulation even of the vision for Victoria Island, he has continually challenged the privatization, the, the land ownership claims at the site, and has written a lengthy paper that we shall also be posting later on our Asenabka page. So you'll be able to uh, reference it there. And uh, yeah, so um, another, another person like passionately concerned to see public honoring of a special place. Oh, and I already told you about Grandfather William Commander being honored by the president uh, of Carleton University. So that actually brings my long story to a full, full, uh, full end. Um, and this is where I was saying that, wow, partly I'm trying to do these live videos to uh, link between indigenous, grassroots, NGO, government, and academic ways of uh, generating knowledge and uh, recognizing today that we're all um, are facing the same uh, crises with the coronavirus, with the environmental challenges, and that we need to bridge together to better understand each other, to better uh, move towards uh, a journey for a culture of peace. Today, this very, very special moment in the uh, cosmic world uh, gives some of us cause for further reflection on where we move into the future in time. And um, uh, we hope uh, it will provoke some serious thinking on the part of leadership all across the world. Uh, Credo Mutwa said uh, of prophecy, Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, said of prophecy, what is that but an early warning signal? Uh, Evelyn Dewashi talked about Grandpa uh, Smith and his early warning about what was, what has evolved right now. The, the, and uh, uh, perhaps there are ways for us to pay better attention to this, or perhaps there are better ways for us to prepare for the challenges that are uh, in front of us. Um, um, Emmelyn uh, uh, Saylor, one of our other students working on the William Commander archives, um, pulled together, helped me pull together a list of links that you will be able to access should you want to learn a little bit more about why this is so special, this particular moment in time, when Jupiter and Saturn form the first visible double planet in 800 years on the winter solstice. Uh, I think I even have a link that uh, shows you uh, what will be happening in South Africa. Yes, the Christmas star uh, and how it, uh, will reveal itself in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm um, noting also the post by our Circle of All Nations colleague, Delfina Nova, um, when she's talking about the coming, the dawning of the age of Aquarius during this uh, uh, moment. And, and, um, and that's uh, relevance in terms of, you know, the, 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 the zodiac and that movement uh, uh, of the sun through the larger circuit. And a new friend uh, has also posted another interesting post. That's Del, Del Oloske. Oh, and I'd like to also mention that where we have some new friends on, on uh, amongst my circle of all nations colleagues who have been posting amazing rock calendar uh, rock sites of the americans of the uh, atlantic seaboard 
So they, they've been tracking uh, rock placement sites where the ancient peoples um, set up amazing, amazing rock uh, structures. Some of them um, with features that indicate they have been touched, they've been uh, created by, um, partially formed by human hands. And in fact, Grandfather William Commander and I went to Catfish Lake in Algonquin Park many years ago with uh, a Bo Allen, an archaeologist, and uh, we uh, visited the giant turtle rock. And it's quite obvious that that turtle sits on three feet. One of the feet has been uh, moved off or eroded, but it was obviously placed on these feet and shaped as a turtle. And uh, this uh, um, amazing rock affirms something significant about the knowledge of the indigenous peoples. Many of these rock uh, uh, formations or creations uh, reveal um, uh, tracking of the solstice, tracking of the uh, movement of the sun. And this has been some of the work that we've already been talking about for a long time with our friends uh, Bill, Bill Sullivan and others. We've talked about uh, the documentaries about when before the um, before the land was Champlain over the, the ancient uh, uh, landscape. Uh, <coughs> and I'm sorry, I'm not getting the, the title of the video properly yet, but it is a, a, a series about the hidden landscape. And um, all of these affirm uh, an intriguing knowledge of indigenous peoples, the Americas and of the American Northeast regarding the cosmic and the cosmic is playing out for us today. Uh, I think that's about all I am going to share today. Uh, thank you very much for your patience through this hectic moment. I'm going to go to Facebook Live to see if there is in fact anybody visible there. And oh, there's Patricia. Uh, so somebody has been able to hear us. And I'm not exactly sure if Sarah is there. Uh, perhaps not. But uh, folk, if uh, you go to watch this uh, video later, please add your comments and your thoughts about it. And um, hopefully over the course of this Christmas period, we'll be able to label these properly and then you'll be able to follow which segments of the videos are helpful for your ongoing thinking and education. And I shall now um, finish off with our special Circle of All Nations commemorative video uh, where Wakeway tells us to navigate uh, and uh, Jade um, presents us with uh, an image uh, uh, in video of Mother Earth in the Save Us song, and where Karen has uh, drawn together so many images capturing Grandfather William Commander's work in this special commemorative video for 2020. Final word, you know, uh, we talked about reconciliation a few days ago, so I won't do too much more about that. But with the new year, a reminder that for many, many cultures was a moment for forgiveness, for letting old hurts and injustices uh, fall into uh, uh, some zone of reconciliation so that we can move into the future uh, together. And it's critically important in this day and age that we learn how to do that. Um, and so from Circle of All Nations, thank you to all the, uh, the colleagues who have animated the Circle of All Nations uh, work over the years. Thank you for your patience and listening to me stumble through my words. Uh, it's not really very easy to do this kind of thing. And especially without grandfather uh, twirling his feather behind my back to wind me up. But nonetheless, it's great honor nonetheless to try. 
uh, to help support the raising of consciousness that so many other people are also engaged in during these unprecedented times with great love and great uh, respect for this amazing journey. Miigwech. Very best, and we'll see you in the new age, the age of Aquarius that is dawning. The idea for this video began when the Heart Star Festival came looking for musical contributions to inspire environmental stewardship. William Commander was the greatest leader in this regard. His passion for all things related to the environment was evident in every breath he took during his journey here on Mother Earth. Commander in 1997 when I was working in Indigenous Justice. I have coordinated his Circle of All Nations work since then. anniversary of the Circle of All Nations International Millennium Peace Gathering hosted at Nepean Point in Ottawa May 22nd to May 25th in 2000. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Keep safe. Wishing you all the very best. Be great. Bye bye.